I'm Admiral Masterson, Skid Masterson. I'm the President General of the Society. I want to welcome each and every one of you here with us tonight. In many ways, this will be a historic night for us because this is one of the early events sponsored by our newly created American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati. Uh, the thing that makes it unique, you've been to Clark Lectures before, many or most of you, but for the first time ever, no matter where you are in our society, you'll be able to watch tonight's lecture. We'll be streaming it live. And um, those of you for whom we have email addresses got an email earlier in the last day or so that told you how to do it. But in any event, uh, we're very much looking forward to tonight's lecture and then to the uh, cocktails, which will be up in the Olmsted Gallery when we break, and, uh, and then a buffet supper, which we uh, will share down here in the, uh, in the uh, uh, dining room afterwards. Uh, at this point, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our uh, super chairman of the History Committee, Scott Johnson, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Before I make my introduction, I've been asked to let everyone know in the new C-14, there's an article about the new history of the South Carolina Society, The Fabric of Liberty. Uh, it is available in the foyer uh, if you would like to purchase a copy. And in a commercial note, you don't even have to pay cash. You can sign your name and they'll mail you the invoice. So uh, that will be available outside. As chairman of the History Committee of the General Society of the Cincinnati, it is my great honor to present the 2012 George Rogers Clark Lecturer, Dr. Walter Bellingrath Edgar. Dr. Edgar is a native of Mobile, Alabama, an alumnus of Davidson College, and earned his PhD at the University of South Carolina. He's the author or editor of more than a dozen books on South Carolina and the American South, and of particular interest to us here this evening, Partisans and Redcoats, the Southern Campaign that Turned the Tide of the American Revolution. Earlier this year, Dr. Edgar retired from the University of South Carolina, where he was for 32 years the director of the Institute for Southern Studies. He is currently the Claude Henry Neffer Professor Emeritus of Southern Studies and Distinguished Press me, Professor of History Emeritus. In 2001, he received the Distinguished Alumnus Award from the University of South Carolina, and in 2008, he was inducted into the South Carolina Hall of Fame. In 2006, he was admitted as an honorary member of the Society of the Cincinnati of the State of South Carolina and currently serves as its George Washington Distinguished Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Edgar. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. The American Revolution is not only my academic uh, favorite area. It's also getting the word out. It's something of a hobby horse. I'm going to ride. Now, in American history, especially the story of the American Revolution, has often been neglected in textbooks used in college classrooms for almost half a century. If you asked most Americans to discuss the Revolution, they would start with Lexington and Concord, fair enough, probably go to Bunker Hill, Saratoga, and then Yorktown, the end. <laughs> In general, not just textbooks, but history's 20th and 21st century historians, for the most part, consider the war in the South to be simply a sideshow. And somehow, it did all again end at Yorktown. The revolution that these writers present is not an American revolution. It's a New England Revolution with just a passing nod to the middle colonies and none to the South. <laughs> now, I know there's some excellent monographs and studies of the war in the South, but it is from general histories and from textbooks that most Americans get their history. And so for the last decade, one of my non-academic hobbies has been reviewing textbooks and see what they say about uh, the revolution. And it's not a very encouraging scene. 
There was one text which was published first in the 1980s and has been reissued ever since. It devotes five pages to the American Revolution. Three to social and political issues, two to the war itself. A more recent text, and by that I mean 2012, just four to the war itself that opens with this statement. The course of the war is soon told. If there ever were an understatement, that is it. This same author dismisses, he literally dismisses the battles of Kings Mountain, Cowpens, and Guilford Courthouse as being neither decisive nor particularly important. And even when things are mentioned, there is an imbalance. It's roughly on an average in terms of the discussion when they do talk about the war, it's two to one for what happened north of the Mason-Dixon line to one what happened um, south. That's, pr that's, that's pretty typical. And then in today's textbooks, unfortunately, it's, it's focus in how they deal with the war. One new textbook has a German Baroness's account of, bird's eye account of Burgoyne's surrender at Saratoga. Her first person narrative from her diary gets more ink, as the press would say, than the entire Southern campaign. Or there's another text that devotes more space to a discussion of Mel Gibson's The Patriot than it does to Yorktown. <laughs> or even another where there is what they call side discussions on, and I quote, mercenaries in global perspective. More words, more text than the Southern campaign. And then there is the sad case of a book of readings on American history where the chapter on the American Revolution is entitled, Was the American Revolution Largely a Product of Market-Driven Consumer Forces? <laughs> now, even when they sometimes get it right, they oversimplify. In January 1781, and I'm quoting now from literally a brand new 2012 text just out this year. In January 1781, at the Battle of Cowpens in northwestern South Carolina, General Daniel Morgan inflicted a costly defeat on Colonel Bannister Tarleton, one of Cornwallis' most effective officers. Cornwallis pursued Morgan hotly, but the American rejoined Green, and at Guilford Courthouse they again inflicted heavy losses on the British. All of that is true, but that, that's their discussion of the war from Cowpens to Guilford Courthouse. Now what about Green's brilliant race to the dam? The strategy that left Cornwallis' army 230 miles from its supply base in South Carolina in enemy territory in midwinter without adequate supplies among those that Cornwallis himself described as timid friends and inveterate rebels. Contemporaries of Lord Cornwallis knew the significance of what had happened. Sir so Horace Walpole said, Lord Cornwallis has conquered his troops out of shoes and provisions and himself out of troops. <laughs> now, a textbook that is used in many of the universities in the 13 states has a three-page session, and this will be my last explication of a textbook, on the war in the South. One full page is to one, I think I just lost the mic. There, there we go, okay. One full page is devoted to the artistic analysis of Trumbull's surrender of Cornwallis. There's a half a page map, just lost it, just lost it again. All right. Okay, can you hear me? No, okay, all right. All right, I didn't get a PhD in engineering. <laughs> Okay, you have a half, half a page, I mean, a full page of artistic analysis, a half a page map, which by the way is a beautiful map, unlike a couple of other books that have Kings Mountain in the wrong state. <laughs> and then a half a page uh, of William Rennie's famous Battle at Cowpens with William Washington and Bannister Tarleton. There is only one full page of written words of text describing the Southern campaign from Savannah to Yorktown. Now, how can you expect people to understand what happened when you oversimplify? Uh, now, alas, the bias of historians is not limited to what happened during the war itself. What happened before the war 
leading up to the road to independence, whether you start at 1763, 1765, or 1770, and that varies from textbook to textbook. Without exception, almost every text cites examples of colonial protest, petitions to king and parliament, boycotts, resolutions, and individual acts of patriotism from non-Southern colonies. About the only Southern pre-Revolutionary War patriot that gets mentioned at all anymore is Patrick Henry. And then in two of the textbooks, they're more interested in his opposition to Alexander Hamilton and his program after the war than they are to his famous comments on uh, the Virginia Resolves. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm demeaning actions that occurred in New England and the middle colonies. That is not the purpose. However, the American Revolution was an American revolution. So don't you think there should be examples cited elsewhere? Just for example, if there are some people talk about warning about the enemy, and obviously Paul Revere comes to mind. He was a great silversmith. <laughs> And he did alert the countryside, but he was one of now, as they find out, he and his fellow riders, then it was like a chain. They, you know, he didn't do it all by himself. If you want to look at a real heroic midnight ride, I would mention Captain John Jewett, Jr. of Virginia. His all-night ride in June of 1781 to warn Governor Thomas Jefferson that Bannister Tarleton and his legionnaires were headed to Charlottesville to capture him and members of the assembly is not only a midnight ride, it was through enemy territory. And had he been detained by Tarleton's legionnaires as Revere was detained by the British, there's no question of what Tarleton and his men would have done to somebody they called rebels. They wouldn't let him go, go back home. Or what would they have done had they called Thomas Jefferson? and it was still a very narrow escape. And then for my friends from South Carolina, <clears throat> excuse me, there is Jane Black Thomas. I'm not bringing Mrs. Thomas in because she is a woman. I'm not being politically correct. Um, she was over 60 years of age. Now, those of us over 60 don't think that's old today. <laughs> but believe me, in 1780, over 60 was she was more than a senior citizen. She was tending to her wounded husband, who was a prisoner of war. He'd been commander of the Spartan Regiment at 96, a British strong point. She overheard the wives of some English officers talking about mounting an ambush raid on what was left of the Spartan Regiment in Spartan District there along the North Carolina line. She stole a horse, rode 60 miles across the state, to warn the Spartan Regiment, which then ambushed the British at the First Battle of Cedar Springs. Now, again, you say, well, they wouldn't have harmed a woman. Ladies and gentlemen, what the English Army of Occupation was doing in South Carolina in 1780 and 81, gender or age made no difference as to how they treated you because you were, as Cornwallis called, uh, a rebel. But even if you don't want to mention her with her heroic ride as for that part, most textbooks now want to include examples of what women did in the Revolution. And I will, I can't remember the exactly, but I'd say at least 80 to 90 percent, Abigail Adams gets a mention, okay? I think what Ms. Thomas did is pretty nice. And then, what about, the, what about the mother of our seventh president? Elizabeth Hutchinson Jackson. Her husband had already died, but after the British occupation and those horrible POW ships had been opened in Charleston Harbor. She volunteered to go to Charleston and nurse ill Americans on board those war hulls. She caught what they call ship fever, died, and was buried in an unmarked grave. A sacrifice for the American cause. I think that's something, and it's not unknown, but it could have been uh, included. And then there's an the issue of political unrest. I'm, I'm very familiar with what happened in New York, Philadelphia, particularly in, in Boston. But in 1765, the Commons House of Assembly of South Carolina, which as one Tory newspaper editor said, had a very exaggerated opinion of itself. Um, nothing's changed much with the General Assembly. 
But in 1765, they passed a series of more than 20 resolutions, including one that said, in taxing ourselves and making laws for our own internal government, we can by no means allow our provincial legislature to be subordinate to any legislative power on earth. That's treason. They're saying, Parliament, you have no right to legislate for us. In 1774, the first Virginia Convention elects its delegates to the Continental Congress. So does South Carolina, which also appoints a general committee to overlook revolutionary activities. The association boycotting British goods is in place throughout the colonies. And there's that famous cartoon in one of the English journals that pictures the ladies of Edenton, North Carolina, and their boycott of tea. That used to be a staple in American history textbook, that cartoon of the ladies and their tea party. It's not there anymore. It's not there anymore. Um, and then you have other political re resolutions on the eve of uh, before 1776. The residents of Botetourt, Virginia, resolved that we cannot part with our liberty but with our lives. Our duty to God, our country, and our posterity all forbid it. And in May 1775, the residents of Mecklenburg County, North Carolina, passed what has been called the Mecklenburg Declaration of Independence, which said that the citizens of the county should be a free and independent people. So there's, there are plenty of examples that are out there that can be used either with or perhaps instead of what necessarily happened in Philadelphia or in, in Boston. In March 76, South Carolina adopted a state constitution, the second state to do so. She was followed by Virginia with the third state constitution. And there was military activity prior to the Declaration of Independence. In April 1775, the General Committee of South Carolina seized all arms and ammunition from the State House and the powder magazines that were spread across Charleston Neck. In June, the powder magazine in Williamsburg is seized. In November 1775, there's a fight between Tory militia and what is now the General Committee or the part, uh, Patriot uh, occupation of Starfort at 96 in South Carolina, followed by a very bloody campaign called the Snow Campaign of December 1775 because the snow literally stayed on the ground for weeks at a time. And that was fought by militia from North and South Carolina and pretty well put the kibosh on Tory activity in the backcountry at least for a while. And of even more importance, that snow campaign snuffed out a grand plan by Lord William Campbell, the last royal governor of South Carolina, to mobilize the back country, not just in South Carolina, but in the North Carolina and Georgia, against the revolution in, on the coast. And then we have Great Bridge in Virginia in December 1775. Governor Dunmore, the royal governor, was intent upon reducing the colony into resistance, and he issued a proclamation. He said, martial law requiring every person capable of bearing arms to re resort to my standard under penalty of forfeiture, for, excuse me, forfeiture of life and property, and then he then declared freedom to all indentured servants, Negroes or others appertaining to the rebels, if they would join for the reduction of the colony to a proper sense of duty. Now, Governor Dunmore got few takers. But the Virginia Council of Safety sent Colonel, Colonel William Woodford and two men, two, some 200 men to the Norfolk area that Dunmore was using as his base of operations. And there the Virginians erected a breastwork on the high ground on the north side of the Great Bridge. Governor Dunmore decided to attack on the 9th of December. It only took about 14 minutes and half the enemy were killed and wounded. The British would eventually abandon Norfolk on New Year's Day, 1776, but before Governor Dunmore left, he set fire to the town and laid much of it waste. George Washington said of Governor's actions, I hope this and the threatened devastation of other places will unite the whole country in one indissoluble band against a nation which seems lost to every sense of virtue and those feelings which distinguished a civilized people from the most barbarous savages. And there was significance to the Battle of Great Bridge. Immediately thereafter, the Virginia Convention authorized the raising of another seven regiment of troops. And in February 76, at Moore's Creek Bridge in North Carolina, 
a band of Tory Highlanders, and how Highlanders who had immigrated to the American South after the Battle of the Culloden can take up the King's colors is frankly beyond me. Uh, I've asked Leland Park to explain it, and he can't, so I'll just leave it uh, at that. But the purpose of this, <clears throat> excuse me, it was several thousand of these men marching to the coast was to meet up with Sir Henry Clinton and Lord Cornwallis and the British Expeditionary Force. Word spread and Patriot forces managed to maneuver, and it was Colonel James Moore who had overall command of this operation, maneuver them to Moore's Creek Bridge, ground of the Patriots choosing, and it was a route for the American cause. And because of Moore's Creek Bridge, the Tory movement in North Carolina went underground, and it caused the British to change their plans from invading North Carolina, and earlier today someone asked me when I mentioned that, it's because King George considered North Carolina his most loyal province. That's why they had chosen North Carolina. So Clinton and Cornwallis said, okay, we're gonna go to South Carolina. Now this is June of 1776. We're still a month away from the Declaration of Independence. And for a month, the British maneuver off Charleston Harbor. So Henry Clinton, like Dunmore, issues a proclamation denouncing this most wicked and unprovoked rebellion in South Carolina. The succession of the crimes of the inhabitants, the tyranny of the colonies, Congress and committees, the era of an infatuated and misguided multitude whose duty was to forthwith help put down their arms against the king. And he said, because of my sense of humanity, if you come to the king's service, you will get free pardon. Now, Governor Clinton's proclamation had no more effect than did Lord Dunmore's. The British launched a sea and land attack against Patriot positions on Sullivan's Island, where the unfinished sand and palmetto log fort was commanded by Colonel William Moultrie. Uh, the enemy had landed on a neighboring island, and the plan was, it, like I say, it was an amphibious. It wasn't just a, a bombardment by sea, which certainly did take place. They were landing troops that were going to cross breaches inlet and get on the island and come into the back of the fort because it was unfinished. The backside of what we now call Fort Moultrie had not yet been completed. But they hadn't counted on um, a young group of men from Orangeburg District. They were part of a ranger company commanded by one of my local heroes, Colonel William Danger Thompson. His men called him Danger. He was not somebody you wanted to mess with. <laughs> But they were members of the South Carolina line. And their sharpshooting kept the British from crossing Breaches Inlet and had as much to do with the saving of Fort Moultrie as did the brave garrison who withstood the bombardment. Now, the significance, Congress was very, they printed a, you know, minted a medal in honor of Sullivan's Island. And more importantly for General Washington and the new continent, emerging Continental Army, that do -si do outside of Charleston kept seven regiments of British troops in the South for several months. And it thwarted British, thwarted, oh, okay. Seems, I'm sorry, it seems to go in and out. That thwarted, okay, all right, something. Okay, all right, it's back. And the whole idea of the loss at Sullivan's Island, the British lost three ships, and just, not just the battle. It kept them from deciding to invade South Carolina at that particular time. And so along with Moore's Creek Bridge, it put the Tories into deep hiding in the South. Now, please note, that all three of these victories, Great Bridge, Moore's Creek Bridge, Sullivan's Island, take place before America officially declared independence. After independence, from Georgia to Virginia, July to October 1776, the Cherokee went on the war against the frontier, and the two Carolinas, Georgia and Virginia, in return, 
retaliated against Cherokee settlements eventually in the spring and summer of 1777, forcing the Cherokee to a peace treaty. In July 1778 to February of 1779, George Rogers Clark staged his successful campaign against Indians in present-day Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, culminating in the capture of the settlements at Kaskaskia, Cahokia, and Vincennes. Sadly, except in only one or two textbooks that I reviewed, do Clark's exploits get any mention whatsoever. Now, let's turn to what we call the Southern Campaign. Cornwallis called it his great campaign, his grand strategy. February, beginning in February 18, excuse me, 1780. There hadn't been any, much of any military activity along the coast in the South uh, between 76 and 78. But English politics intervened. There was growing opposition to the war in Parliament. The government of Lord North needed a big victory for political reasons. Why the southern colonies? Well, first of all, King George was convinced that there were lots of loyalists in the South. His royal governors had told him so. All they needed was for the British to land troops, and these thousands of loyalists would come out of the woods and join His Majesty's uh, army. Also, the southern coastline made it easy to use the Royal Navy in support of military operations, and that's, that's a pretty key point. And if you looked at the southern colonies within the empire economically, in terms of trade, the southern colonies were the most important. By 1770, Little South Carolina, one of the smaller of the 13 colonies, amounted or accounted for 29% of the value of trade within the empire from the 13 North American colonies. You add in the other colonies from the south, and you can see why they're looking at that area. It's important to get the southern colonies back. In fact, economic historians have determined that the three richest areas of British North America in 1774 were located, all located in the south, South Carolina, Maryland, and Virginia. The English generals over here, Clinton and Cornwallis, bought into the plan, and their plan had stages. And they actually did, Cornwallis really did put together a plan with he and Clinton. Well, they argue who actually did it. It depends upon whether it succeeded or not. <laughs> if it failed, the other one said it was their idea uh, on a particular part of it. The first plan was to take Savannah, then the interior of that colony, and establish royal government. The British Army would then move northward and roll up the remaining southern colonies along the way, as the king expected, those loyalists would rise up and return royal governments to South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia. And then the war would be over. The Americans would sue for peace. Well, the British plan began in Savannah in 1778, and it began brilliantly for the British. In November, they landed on the Georgia coast and greatly outnumbering the small American army, overwhelmed the Patriots completely. And what little opposition to the British remained in places like Ebenezer and Augusta in the interior were easily brushed aside. The royal governor returned and was reinstalled. Once again, royal government, Georgia was a colony in the British Empire. Part one of the plan had gone exactly as it was supposed to do. And a military gentleman, I can tell you, ladies, that's very rare when things go exactly the way you expect them to. Well, besides the fact that it went through the British wanted it to do, all of a sudden, the Continental Congress realized they had a problem. They hadn't really paid much attention to the Southern Theater up to this point. They think we need a new commander. They send in General Benjamin Lincoln as the new commander of the Continental Forces in the South. Um, and our allies send a fleet which arrives off Charleston in September 1779. And there's a plan to attack Savannah and bring Georgia back into um, American 
Patriot hands. But the Allied assault on Savannah is a disaster. Uh, the casualty rate for the Americans is very high. When you assault, uh, a frontal assault against a defended position is never a wise idea. Uh, the French, because of the hurricane season, after the failure, pull back to the West Indies. And so the British are left with part one of their plan still in place. Part two is Charleston. Now, from New York, Clinton and Cornwallis sail with an army of some 8,500 men. And I know the figures vary. I've seen them as little as 7,000. I've seen them as many as 12,000. It just depends upon your source. But at about 8,500, that's still a very large invasion force. The fleet had gotten together off the coast of Georgia. They had rendezvoused there. It wasn't any secret what the British were doing. But they landed troops on South Carolina soil without a single shot being fired. There was no opposition to the British landing whatsoever. And as soon as the troops had been landed, the fleet sailed to Charleston Harbor and successfully blockaded it. Nobody was going in of the harbor, sailing in. Nobody was going to uh, sail out. General Lincoln made the decision, probably at the insistence of civilian authorities in South Carolina, to defend the city. If you read Cornwallis's memoirs and those of some of his officers, as they slog, it took them almost six weeks to get to Charleston, to the bank of the Ashley. The rivers, the swamps, the natural defenses that could have been used to defend the city were not. As after the city fell, which eventually it did after a very traditional siege, English said, well, it was like putting a stopper in a bottle. Because Charleston, of course, folks, is on a peninsula. And if you, if you fortify the peninsula, which is what Lincoln did, all the British had to do was blockade the harbor, move their troops around, and begin a traditional siege warfare, which they did, very, and just eventually bombard the city. And on May the 12th, 1780, 5,500 American men in uniform surrendered to um, Lord Cornwallis and Sir Henry Clinton. And that included, by the way, most of the Virginia line, which was in Charleston at the time. After Charleston surrendered, so did the American forts in the rest of the state. Charleston was a disaster for the American cause. Up until Charleston, yes, losing Savannah was bad, but America kept saying, look what happened at Saratoga. Well, after Charleston, memories of Saratoga in terms of public relations were wiped off the map. You have just lost what the imperial press would talk about, this, the conquest and complete reduction of this opulent, populous, and very important colony of South Carolina. Part two of the plan is going just like it should. To many Carolinians, the American cause seemed lost. In a letter to Lord Germain, Secretary of State for the Colonies, Clinton wrote, there are few men in South Carolina who are not either our prisoners or in arms with us. But in six weeks, all of that would change dramatically as the British occupation of South Carolina began to unravel. And it unraveled first at a little settlement area on the border of the two Carolinas called the Waxhaws. Colonel Abram Buford with his Virginia Continentals was marching south to relieve or reinforce Lincoln in Charleston. He heard about the surrender. He turned around and was marching back uh, north when his uh, 200 men were overtaken by Bannister Tarleton and his legionnaires. And there, those 200 men uh, tried to surrender, and many were cut down and stabbed, bayoneted, sabered in, in cold blood. This gives rise to what is called in the deep south part of the colonies in the two Carolinas, Tarleton's Quarter. You know in the 18th century if you were surrendering you asked for quarter. Well, the Americans asked for quarter and it was not given. And so in many a description, a diary or a letter in the conflicts, whether it's a, a major battle like Kings Mountain or whether it's a small skirmish at Thickety Ford or Cedar Springs, 
when the other side tried to surrender, frequently the reply would be, you will get Tarleton's quarter. Tarleton's brutality and that of the British Army of Occupation turned what seemed to be a conquered province into a hornet's nest. Now, Cornwallis had some other successes after uh, Charleston. Clinton sailed back to New York, leaving Cornwallis in charge. The Battle of Camden. General Gates, newly installed commander of the army in the south, is pushing his troops to meet with the British. He wants a quick victory. Cornwallis is pushing north to go after Gates. They stumble into each other in Camden. Uh, the American, it should have been, Gates really should have withdrawn. He didn't. He forced the battle, the Continental Line held, the militia did not, and it was a rout. Nobody ran faster, sadly, than did General Gates, who didn't stop till he got to Hillsborough. His men called him Galloper Gates. Now, I know he's a hero of Saratoga, but he was not the hero of Camden. Two days later, at a little place called Fishing Creek in South Carolina, not one of General Thomas Sumter's better moments, he was caught with his men and routed again, tracked down and surrounded by Tarleton, and uh, Sumter literally escaped by a hair's breadth to, in turn, raise an army again, much to Cornwallis's frustration. Two weeks after Sumter had been defeated, Cornwallis is writing to Clinton saying, the indefatigable Sumter has raised another thousand men. He was a great recruiter. Now, those were two big battles, but after Charleston, there were lots of smaller ones in South Carolina and in the borderlands, because we didn't really have a nice welcome center between North and South Carolina at, uh, at that time. Places like Cedar Springs, Hanging Rock, Thickety Fort may seem minor to folks who are not from that area, but all of these are leading up to Kings Mountain. Because of what um, Cornwallis and Tarleton referred to as minor commotions, Cornwallis instructed Major James Ferguson to raise a loyalist militia, and he did, a thousand men, to put down these commotions. Ferguson issued two proclamations, one to the men of Western North Carolina and what you would call, at that time, Western North Carolina included Eastern Tennessee, the over the mountain area. Uh, very insulting about their masculinity, what they were gonna, they were gonna all be put to the sword, their homes burned, what have you. And basically, if you're a real man, you'll put down your arms and join the king. Well, the response of these frontiersmen to these threats was to meet in the banks of the Watauga. A thousand of these over mountain men crossed over the mountains into western North Carolina. They soon met up with militia from the two Carolinas, Georgia uh, and Virginia. And at Kings Mountain, it is in South Carolina, they surrounded Ferguson and his men atop this particular piece of terrain. It's about the size of a present day football field. Now, Ferguson was so arrogant, he did not believe that the rabble would attack him in his position. He had no intelligence. That's one thing that had happened because of these string of American commotions, successful commotions after Camden and Fishing Creek is that Cornwallis's intelligence network was beginning to dry up. He's on Kings Mountain, does not sit in a defensive position. And the Americans on command, after two days of heavy rain, charge up the hill and take Ferguson and his entire command. A thousand men are put out of action, either killed, wounded, or prisoners of war. Sir Henry Clinton's remarks in his memoirs about Kings Mountain said, this unhappily proved the first 
link in a chain of evils that followed each other in regular succession until they at last ended in the loss of America. General Washington said, King's Mountain is the proof of the spirit and sorry, is proof of the spirit and resources of the country. The significance of this is Cornwallis has to withdraw from Charlotte, North Carolina, back into South Carolina to regroup, and his planned invasion of North Carolina and Virginia is put off for a year because of King's Mountain. When he takes to the field again, he's going to more than meet his match in terms of military strategy and tactics in the person of Nathaniel Green. Green comes south. Uh, in Hillsborough, there is a remnant of what had escaped from the Battle of Camden. He brings with him Daniel Morgan, and they begin to rally the local militia in and around the Charlotte area. And because the British had just left Charlotte, there's, no, there's nothing there to feed his army. So Green decides he's going to do something a little bit daring. First of all, he moves the main portion of his army and his headquarters to Shirawal, South Carolina, just across the line, where he can get food and fodder and also threaten Camden, which is the most important British outpost in the, in the back country. And then he sends Morgan and a, and a portion of his army westward around the flank of Cornwallis's army, probably heading towards 96. At any rate, as you know, Cornwallis decide to div divide his forces to meet this American threat, and at Cowpens in Spartan District, South Carolina, Bannister Tarleton leading that particular wing of Cornwallis's army, and Daniel Morgan's men clash. Now, folks, it is called Cowpens because it literally was a Cowpens. It was open to rain. Also, by this time, because of, again, the com commotions, militia had been flocking to Morgan and to Green, but particularly to Morgan. Morgan chose it because if the word went out, go to the cowpens and meet up with Morgan, people knew where Hannah's cowpens were. Um, and the Battle of Cowpens, I'm pleased to say, is still being studied at the United States Military Academy in terms of military tactics. Daniel Morgan knew his men, he knew his enemy, and he knew the terrain, and he knew the strengths and weaknesses of particularly his men and the enemy. He ordered the militia to fire twice and retreat, hoping that the British would follow, thinking that that was again going to be an, e an easy route. Uh, and he knew that because Tarleton was so impetuous. He, again, looking at the mind of his, his foe. This is the only pitched battle, as I'm sure you know, in the American Revolution where British troops ran from an American army. Tarleton and his feared British legion were totally defeated. And it was, noted historian John Selby, one of the most brilliant victories of the war. Before Cowpens, and before Tarleton lost a thousand effectives at Cowpens, Cornwallis's army was between 3,500 and 4,000. So 25% of that army is now gone after Cowpens. And in addition, Tarleton did escape by the skin of his teeth, but he destroyed all of his military supplies and materiel to keep them from falling into rebel hands. The significance is, once again, success brought out fighters for the American cause, and it sent a message to the Tories, you better still continue to lay low. And I mentioned that intelligence was bad before Kings Mountain, after Kings Mountain and Cowpens, for the British it was non-existent. And that explains, in many ways, how once Morgan joins up with Green and they make that race to the Dan, they're always one step ahead of Cornwallis. Now, the race to the Dan in midwinter 
And again, it was a very cold winter, uh, 1780, 1781. In fact, in February, Green wrote to Washington, the miserable situation of the troops has rendered the march the most painful imaginable. Several hundred of soldiers marking the ground with their bloody feet. However, our armies in good spirits, notwithstanding their sufferings and excessive fatigue. Now, once he successfully crossed the Dan River, he was able to get reinforcements, let his army rest. Cornwallis, not being able to cross the Dan, turned back and Green and Morgan let him go, but then shortly thereafter, the vanguard of the revitalized Continental Army in the South crossed the Dan, and in the vanguard was Lieutenant Colonel Henry Lee. Cornwallis had gone from being the hunter to the hunted. And just as Morgan had chosen his battleground at Cowpens, so Green chose his battleground at Guilford Courthouse. In fact, he devised a plan that was very much like Morgan's. It didn't work out quite as well. It was a heated battle, an hour and a half, and at one point, Green withdrew his army from the field because he knew it was more important to keep his army together than to keep a piece of terrain. This is one of those men who seldom won a battle, but he won the war in the South by keeping his army together. Cornwallis held the field, but it was a costly victory for him. He lost another fourth of his men at, at uh, Guilford Courthouse. In Parliament, analogies were made to the classic battle, uh, the Pyrrhic victory, another such victory, and we are undone. In the space of two months, the British Army in the South has been reduced by more than half. And ladies and gentlemen, it is already a beaten army. Cornwallis is giving up on the Carolinas. His biographers called Guilford Courthouse a victory, but then add, so dearly bought that Cornwallis could never resume the offensive again in the Carolinas. He begins a three-week retreat to Wilmington on the coast, and from there he wrote a colleague, I assure you that I'm quite tired of marching about the countryside in search of adventures. <laughs> However, being the good political general that he was, he had a plan. Writing to Clinton, he said, all we've got to do is I'll move my army into Virginia. You bring down all those folks from New York. We'll again come to Virginia and we take Virginia. The war will be over. Well, he had hoped that Green would follow him into Virginia and then they'd have another battle. Green didn't do that. He turned back to South Carolina. And at Hobkirk Hill, which is near Camden, there was a vicious fight between um, the new Southern Army and uh, the British there near Camden. It was pretty much a draw, but again, those in South Carolina that were supposed to hold the territory for the king could ill afford their losses. Every man lost was a man that could not be replaced. And even though they won at Hobkirk Hill, technically, three days later or four days later, they abandoned Camden and ordered the evacuation of most of their posts in the interior. Green decides that it would be a good idea for Francis Marion, Andrew Pickens, Thomas Sumter, and Henry Lee and their mobile forces to move around the region and capture, pick off outposts one by one. And they did from Augusta to Orangeburg to Fort Mott to Georgetown. Green had several more battles in the South, the siege of 96. Uh, he was on the cusp of success when word rides arrived of British reinforcements coming from Charleston. So once again, he withdrew to save his army. And then for the summer, he took a respite. It was nice to take an R&R &R back in those days. You could do it in the winter, you could do it in the summer. He chose the summer to be in the high hills of the Santee, which were elevated territory, helpful um, for his army to recoup, re-equip, and get larger. But then he moves back into 
South Carolina in the, towards Charleston in the fall of, and at Utah Springs, he commands what really is one of the hottest battles of, of the war. His men, once again, initially take the field, then they become disorderly, looking really for more equipment, both Continentals and, but especially militia. But Green, Green once again, withdraws his forces. And after the Battle of Utah Springs, the British are pretty much confined to an enclave in and around Charleston. In North Carolina, there is a fierce four-hour militia battle at Lindsay's Mill between Patriots and Tories. The governor of North Carolina, the Patriot governor, has been captured by some Tory militia. And at Lindsay's Mill, the Patriots are trying to save him. They don't, and they take him on down to Wilmington. So you've got fortified enclaves at Wilmington, at Savannah, and in Charleston. And because you do have these enclaves, there are always skirmish. There's fighting going on all the time because the British are sending foraging parties into the countryside. Meanwhile, back to Lord Cornwallis. He moves north to Virginia. Uh, he waits until he hears what's happening to Green in South Carolina. He hears about Hobkirk Hill, which is reported to him as a tremendous victory. So South Carolina is safe, he thinks, and he takes his tattered uh, army north. Then, as his biographers note, on the 13th of May, 1781, Cornwallis crossed his Rubicon, the Roanoke River. The campaigns in and around Yorktown are familiar to you all. The great victory, the surrender on the 19th of October. But I think the reaction to that is what people seem to think the war is over with Yorktown. Lord North said, when hearing the news, oh God, it is over. But ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't. The fighting continued in the South for another 18 months. The enemy still occupied not just New York, but Wilmington, Charleston, Savannah, St. Augustine. The foraging raids continued in North Carolina until mid-1782, what was called the Tory War, continued unabated, vicious backcountry fighting. In South Carolina, you have not only the vicious fighting of Tory to Tory, but you've also got pitched battles. Places like the Battle of the Cumby, which is actually uh, in the fall of 1782, one of the, I'm sorry, the spring of 1782, one of the last battles. On the Virginia frontier, you've got Colonel Crawford going into the upper Sandusky, You've got the Battle of Blue Licks in what is now Kentucky, and you've got Clark's Battle at Chillicothe in November. So the war wasn't quite over. The British abandoned Wilmington in 1781. They abandoned Savannah a little bit later. Charleston is the last major enclave. But even there, you have got British officers swinging into the Georgetown area, and Major James Weems reports on his final mission, I burnt and laid waste to 15 plantations and houses. On December the 14th, 1782, the British evacuate Charleston more than a year after Cornwallis's surrender, seven years after the first fighting in the state, and the war in the South is finally over. Great Britain's grand plan, the southern strategy to roll up the southern colonies one by one, had been a costly disaster. But also, American fighting men had paid a high price in defeating the enemy. In 1780 and 1781, two years of the fighting, 30% of all American deaths in uniform and 40% of all Americans wounded in uniform took place in the southern colonies. The last two years were crucial, but beginning in 1775, the Patriots of Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia were full participants in the fight for American independence. And if you'll permit me a little bit of parochial pride in South Carolina, I want to quote America's first great historian, who, by the way, was a Boston Brahmin 
by the name of George Bancroft. And Mr. Bancroft said, left mainly to their own devices, after suffering more, daring more, and achieving more than the men of any other state, the citizens of South Carolina brought her back to her rightful place in the Republic. They did, but so did their fellow patriots in Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia. Don't you think it's about time that they got their due? It was, after all, ladies and gentlemen, an American revolution. Thank you very much. Gee, do we have any openings in the South Carolina Society? I'm ready to switch. <laughs> that was fabulous. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Yes. Um, can you comment on the command control of communications between uh, the South and the North? And also the second part of that is the knowledge that the Hummers from the North knew about this going on in the South and wasn't important. Well, uh, the, the, the question was how good were the communications between the South and the North and how much did the forces in the North know what was going on uh, to, to realize it was important. As, as I mentioned earlier, Congress didn't wake up to the fact that there was a problem in the South until after Savannah. And they weren't really, I mean they didn't have much in the way of troops, they didn't have, there was not much in the way of troops. Now Green was in regular communication with Washington throughout the war. But again, you've got to remember, it takes time for something, you know, a letter to get from South Carolina to uh, New York. It, take, it, takes, it takes a while. Um, and there were no real civil governments in, any, in the two Carolinas. Uh, Rutledge still was running around ahead of the British, thank goodness. He never got captured. Uh, Jefferson was running around the countryside in Virginia. Uh, and actually there was a move to impeach Jefferson while he, after his term was, was over. So there's not much in the way of civilians contacting folks and say we need this out of the other. Communications were difficult. Communications were difficult. But once the British move all of their forces here, <coughs> excuse me, to the south, it's pretty obvious that something major is, is going on. Lafayette in yeah. Virginia. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes, Lafayette was playing a cat and mouse game uh, first with Benedict Arnold and then later with Cornwallis after Cornwallis and Arnold uh, joined together. But the events in Yorktown and, and in Virginia are fairly well known. What I wanted to do is there are a lot of people who should know better who don't know anything about what happened in the uh, other, southern, other southern colonies. And so uh, as our President General pointed out, I wanted to keep things on schedule, so I did not go into the same detail with Yorktown as I did with places like Utah Springs or Calpens or Kings Mountain. Uh, Dr. Edgar will be available uh, to answer any further questions you might have. Uh, let's thank him for his really tremendous <laughs> <laughs>